Today's guests are from three uh, fantastic organizations that I have worked with quite a bit over the past several years, and that's Cisco, and we're going to look at their Net Academy through with um, Elaine from uh, Meta Solutions. Uh, then we're going to take a look at some uh, really great resources from code.org. And then um, we're also going to have a presentation from Girls Who Code. So again, um, after the presentations, uh, if there's time, and there probably will be, we will have an open forum. So we can go ahead and get started. Uh, one quick thing I always like to share is the, our Ohio State Plan for Education, which is called Each Child Our Future. And all of the folks today that are presenting uh, really help with creating and enhancing education for Ohio's computer science students. And I always like, to, I want to point out the three core principles there in blue on the right, um, equity, partnerships, and quality schools. And all three of these organizations um, really help out in all of those ways. So it's really exciting to have them today on our call. So we might as well go ahead and jump right into it. So the first person that's going to uh, present is Elaine Horn, and she's going to present on Cisco's Networking Academy, and it's a global education program that provides online IT courses and lessons, simulators, and hands-on labs. Program started way back in 1997 with courses that taught routing and switching, and it has expanded to include programming, operating systems, Internet of Things, and cybersecurity courses and has grown to 12,000 different academies in 180 countries. So Elaine, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and I will pass it over to you. Okay. Hopefully everybody's seeing the presentation. John, can you verify that you're seeing yes. the presentation? Okay. And thanks for all of you for joining us today. This will be a very broad overview of the Cisco Academy program um, due to time constraints. Um, please email me if you would like a one on one conversation after this session. We will set up something. Um, the PowerPoint will be available for download, so you'll see some URLs as we're going through the presentation. Don't worry about jotting them down. You can find them after the, you, they down, um, give the um, presentation to you available for download, so that will be available to you. So uh, the Cisco Academy program started in 1997 in the United States. It is now a global program, has, as John said, with 2.3 million students currently enrolled. The program in Ohio was initiated in 1998 and started with approximately 40 academies that were primarily career centers. There are currently about 100 academies in the state of Ohio. And you might say to yourself, why, why is Cisco doing this? Or why have they done this since 1998? Well, they've, the Cisco Academy program is one of Cisco system's largest corporate social responsibility programs. And you can see on this slide, there are re reasons for continuing to support the program. In Ohio, we've got some new reasons for supporting it because Cisco certifications are listed on the Ohio IT credentials list and they can also earn an industry recognized credential seal by students passing the Cisco certifications. And John does have some URLs for the Ohio's IT credential list and also the industry recognized credential seal that he can share with you as well. So how does it work? So that you're going to notice that you're going to see the partnerships on the slide. The Cisco Networking Academy is definitely built on partnerships and collaboration. Cisco has created the Networking Academy with its content, developed its delivery platform, which we're going to find out is Moodle as the learning management system, and provides its curriculum all free of charge. So when you look at the first partner, Cisco, they're doing this under corporate social responsibility so they can do this with no cost to the customer. 
A critical part of the program is the partner organizations that provide support for the individual academies and train and credit the instructors for the academies. And that's where Meta Solution comes in because we operate as both an academy support center and an instructor training center. So we are in the, the gold part here under partners. Meta does have to charge a small fee for our services. When we talk about academy support, if you're getting academy support from Meta Solutions, the cost of that's normally about between $500 to $1,000 per year, so very affordable. And then instructor training, um, we charge a small fee if you're if you're taking one of our classes, and that's normally for a 40-hour course, we charge about $800. But the important thing to remember, since we've expanded our portfolio quite a bit, not all courses require training. So some courses you can take with no training fee to um, be accredited, et cetera. The academies of the Cisco Networking Academy are schools and other organizations such as prisons, libraries, and community centers. In Ohio right now, we only have schools. We haven't branched out. We've actually talked to some of these other organizations um, in fact, we were in a uh, big conversation with the prisons when the pandemic hit. So you can imagine that conversation automatically ended. The Cisco Network Academy is focused on helping students from all backgrounds and experience gain the skills they need to join the digital workforce. The program engages with employers to provide employment opportunities for students and provides a job matching engine and also an alumni network. So you're going to find out there's a URL down here and what this URL will take you to. And again, these will be available after the session. Take you to something we call the talent bridge, with this, which is the Academy's job matching engine and career resources program. So there's things in here about writing resumes and all the different career resources that you might need. And this is available to anyone. You do not have to be a Cisco Networking Academy to to get to this link, you're not going to be able to have to log in or anything. And it does connect students to opportunity and resources within Cisco and the global network of Cisco partners. You will find more information about Meta's Academy Support Center and Instructor Training Center at this web page. So you see at the top there the web page. We do offer summer training courses and the 2021 Summer Instructor Training Calendar will be posted within the next two weeks on this website. Meta supports about 80 academies in Ohio. We have some others in other states. This list includes career centers, comprehensive high schools, community colleges, and four-year colleges. Since the same curriculum is used at both the secondary and post-secondary academies, articulation agreements, college credit plus, CTAGs, and other Ohio educational initiatives are seamless. Cisco provides its curriculum service and platform free of charge. This program also offers discounts on certification exams and equipment necessary as part of the instructional space. So if there is a course that you're offering where it would benefit for the students to use live equipment, they do um, give us a discount on that. The learning management system that is used is Moodle. Emphasis is always going to be on hands-on labs, so simulators and virtual machines are provided inside our courses. And the big thing that I think is important is Networking Academy's communities. So our community structure that we have set up provide instructors with the connections and resources they need to provide quality instruction both in person and remote. At the beginning of the pandemic, a year over a year ago, Meta organized an Ohio group of Cisco Academy teachers called Teachers Helping Teachers, who began creating and sharing additional instructor instructional resources. This group continues to share Cisco Academy resources on a Google Drive. So basically what they're doing is they're creating um, instructional resources that teachers can use in their classroom and all you have to do is go to our shared Google, Google, Google Drive and download them. In fact, now they're getting to know each other, so they will actually ask each other if they have anything for certain presentations, so they're not reinventing the will. And by the way, I also want to give right now a kudos to Huntington Banks, who is partnering with Meta to provide donated routers. 
uh, schools will begin picking up the donated equipment in Columbus within the next month. And that's just something that's happened within the last couple of months where Huntington Banks contacted me and it need, needs some, um, they got a lot of routers they don't need and they wanted to know if they could donate them and I've contacted some of the academies and we we are finding homes for them. This is just, um, it's not a fancy slide. You're gonna notice all I did was go in and screen capture one of my classes. This one happens to be switching routing and wireless essentials. It's one of the CCNA courses and CCNA stands for Cisco Certified Network Associate. That is a Cisco certification. This is the way it would look for me as an instructor. So you're gonna notice to go into the class the student would click here where it says modules one through four course content. The student view would look a little different than this one. It wouldn't have all, all, all these dates, et cetera, on here, so it would be cleaner. And then also the curriculum will always include exams. So you're gonna notice here would be where the student would go in and click and take the online exam. And this part down here you see at the very bottom, this is part that has been customized by the instructor. So since this was a remote class, you're gonna notice a narrated PowerPoint has been added to this particular section, along with um, four packet tracer, what we call packet tracer activities. And packet tracer is our simulator that we use to simulate networking. And we're up to version eight. So, we'll, you know, we started at version one and we've moved along quite, quite a lot here with packet tracer. And I'm gonna show some sample screens of it and also tell you how you can get a copy of packet tracer if you would like to. This is when you open up the course. So if you would have clicked on the course, if a student clicked on the course, something like this would come up. You're gonna see up here, we've got this basic device configuration. Again, it's the switching routing wireless essentials class. And um, what we're seeing here is the different topics that are in here. What you will notice is there is a packet tracer that's gonna be in here on configuring SSH. This is a module, we call it module. So you're gonna also, also notice that there will be a practice and quiz at the end of the module as well. As you can see, this is on Telnet operations. So what they're trying to show here is this is a Wireshark packet capture. And what they're trying to show is that in Telnet, if we're using Telnet, that you can see the full password down here, CCNA. So they're showing this through the packet sniffer, and we do do this in the CCNA courses these days. And notice the next one would, the next section would be SSH operations. So they would be comparing Telnet to SSH and basically showing the students why they should not be using Telnet these days. So all of this, the curriculum does include video instructions. So we will find out, we don't see any on this particular module, but there will be videos of instructors actually teaching a concept. Uh, there'll be animations, there'll be activities, there'll be labs, um, check your understandings, quizzes, and exams. These are the different uh, Curriculum topics that are covered in our portfolio, which we're gonna look at in just a second. So you're gonna notice, John did notice that we are, um, did say that we are more than networking now. So we've got all these other um, curriculum topics that are covered. And something that I think is real important, most of our instructors do what we call instructor-led courses, uh, which means the instructor creates the class, the, students, the, student, uh, the instructor goes in and adds the students, then the instructor is going to have an account, the student's going to have a student account, and everybody can log into that web page that you saw. But recently, Cisco has started offering a lot of courses in a self-paced format, and this helps smaller, smaller schools or students with different interests, because students can also sign up for an IT course that is not offered at their school through that self-paced option. So this has been a big thing. So if you only got one student, in your, one student in your class that wants to learn about the Internet of Things, we have a course called Introduction to the IoT, and that student could go through that on their own, and you would not lead, need to lead them through the class. We have three different types of classes. Explore classes, as you see, are beginning IT courses. Um, career courses aligned to industry certification. And the complementary courses are not written by Cisco. They are written by partners, but offered through our webpage, netacad.com. Here's the complete portfolio. 
please pay attention to the legend at the bottom when you get this PowerPoint. Make sure you pay attention because it'll it'll identify whether a course can be offered in a self paced format. So you'll see the triangle here can be offered that way, but it also can be instructor led. So don't let that confuse you. And also note that we have some partners down here at the bottom that write courses for us and then what they do is they put it in our learning management system. And if we have time, we will look at some of the courses in more detail. If we don't have time, I'm going to give you a digital course catalog link where you can pretty much get specifics about any of the courses that you see. Some that I would like to highlight real quick is this introduction to Packet Tracer will be a great opportunity for you to get into Packet Tracer and take a look and you're going to notice later I'm going to give you a link where you can get more information about that course. We do have a couple of entry level Linux courses and these courses have the Linux machine built right into the course so you don't even have to download Linux or any have any virtual machines running to operate them. Got a couple of cybersecurity courses. Our more advanced cybersecurity course is this one called CyberOps Associate. We do have some high schools that are using this now. And this one leads, uh, gives the students all the skills that they need to be a cyber analyst. This introduction to IoT course, that particular course is good for anybody. Um, and it's, uh, it's done primarily with videos. So this, most students enjoy this course. Up here we have IT Essentials. This leads to the CompTIA A plus certification. So this is a very popular one in high schools. Networking Essentials is a course that I recommend for anybody that's teaching cybersecurity, automation, IoT, anything like that. Any, any job where you might need to know a little bit of networking or if you just want to teach students about security and the networking of their home network. That's a good one for that. And Please um, notice this one. We've got a Python course, and I just want to tell you that what, what's happening these days is due to automation. You're going to notice when we look down here to CCNA, you're going to see there's three courses in the CCNA series. So there's three courses that students would take to prepare them to take a CCNA um, a exam. Notice automation is in here because what's going to happen, this DevNet Associate course that we have over here, is going to prepare students instead of programming a router one at a time, you're going to program 100 at a time. So you're going to need Python skills. So our next two presenters are going to be talking about coding. So please make sure we need coders. Networkers need coders. Everybody needs coders right now. So hopefully you'll be um, motivated to do that. If you go to this web page and just scroll down, you don't need to log in or anything, scroll down a little bit, you'll find these icons. And these icons will give you some additional information about all the courses we just talked about. Cisco has always advertised their classes as hands-on and continues to build additional tools. Hands-on tools range from the simulation to the physical hardware. So you can either do it with the simulator, you can do it with physical hardware. And they continue to update Packet Tracer. And Packet Tracer 8 was just released. And I will show you a little bit in just a second. Packet Tracer also has a feature called Activity Wizard. And that feature is used to create activities that are automatically graded. So you can imagine teachers like that. Teachers can use this feature to create custom labs too. And you're going to notice that Cisco Academy does, when we have curriculum, some of our courses will have virtual machines in them. And I'm going to go through some of this very quickly because I'm taking up too much time. Here is a um, screenshot of Packet Tracer 8. So this is what Packet Tracer looks like. You're going to notice the directions for the labs over here. We've got two branches here. We've got the Seward branch in Alaska, and we've got another branch down here that are connected through some type of public cloud. And then you've got the data center up here. And notice you've got this uh, these pieces of networking gear that are equipment storage self. This is what we call logical mode. I'm going to switch it over and we're going to go into physical mode. So notice what we see here is everything that was in that Seward branch office. So you're going to see a computer, you're going to see a laptop, you're going to see a couple switches, a wireless access point and a server. And then these are all the things that were in the shelf. So that's the big and they made that big change due to the fact that everybody joined remote learning and they couldn't get into the labs to use their physical equipment to cable up things anymore. And that's where a lot of people make 
problem uh, have issues in real networking. So basically what they did is they uh, enhanced that physical mode so students could actually do the wiring right there in Packet Tracer. Um, just a couple little things. Uh, to become an academy, just click on this link when you get the presentation. Please, if you haven't ever looked at the National Initiative of Cybersecurity Education, their Cybersecurity Week is in October, and they do have a great cybersecurity conference. They didn't have it this year, but they might have it next year, so you might want to watch out for it. I went to it two years ago. It was in San Antonio, and it was very good. And then even if you're in middle school, um, the Cyber Patriot Contest is big these days, too. So if you're teaching cyber, that might be another thing that you might want to use. So there's the link for the complete product catalog. And then the rest of the presentation just has some little things about the, the product catalog. So you, that would be everything that you would need. So thank you for your time. And let me stop sharing so we can go to the next presenter. And I know that was fast and furious. Elaine, that's the way a lot of these presentations, you just, you know, we have a certain amount of time, you just pack it all in there and then we give them resources. So uh, we did post a link to the presentation and I believe a link to Elaine's email. So do reach out to her and I will tell you, I actually was working on that Python course and it was really enjoyable. So, you know. And they just updated that course too, John. So if you created they, it quite some time ago, they, they just did a new update to it. I agree. And, and they just updated that Networking Essentials course, too. So. All right. So our next presenters, uh, we have Katie Hendrickson from Code.org and Kelly Geyer Evans from Battelle, who's one of Code.org's partners. And these are both great organization and great state partners and are national forces in coding and equity work, which is so important for the future of IT and computer science. So I'll go ahead and hand it off to uh, Katie and Kelly. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, John. Um, let me know if you cannot hear me or see my screen. Sounds um, good. All right, great. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so I'm Katie Hendrickson. I work on state policy for code.org. I live here in Ohio in Athens, um, but we are a national nonprofit. Um, our vision is that every student in every school should have the opportunity to learn computer science. And one of the primary ways that we work to accomplish this vision is by creating and making free and accessible and open to anyone um, K through 12 curriculum and teacher support. So our curriculum isn't just about students using the technology and the devices that are in front of them but really more about creating their own apps or solving problems on their own. Um, so we really focus on this creation piece. This is so important um, just because, you know, this is why we see this as a priority. Uh, there's every month, there's a half a million open computing jobs across the country. Um, the jobs are in every industry. They're growing at twice the rate of other jobs. Um, and with those high salaries, that means that they're the number one source of new wages over the next decade in the United States. Um, Ohio, we are 10th among all of the states um, in the tech employees. Um, and so we need these students uh, locally to be able to fill those jobs and to support our economy here. Um, but it's not just about those technology jobs, right? At code.org, we think it's every student who should have um, access and opportunities. And we think that computer science should be a foundational part of every student's basic education. And we also think computer science is more than just coding. Yes, we're called code.org. Um, coding is a key part of computer science, but we also want to prioritize that creativity and collaboration that goes into creating computational artifacts. So the, the problem here is that most schools don't teach computer science. And you know it's been expanding in Ohio in particular. Um, we've seen growth, but yet most districts, 63% of Ohio school districts don't teach computer science, which means 300,000 plus students in our state can't take a course even if they want to. And only 12% of school districts offer more than one computer science course. If we drill down onto those specific courses, uh, looking at AP courses and just looking at high schools that have any AP students. Um, so this isn't all high schools, just the ones that have AP. Only 15% teach APCSA and only 21% teach APCS principles. 
those numbers are growing, um, but not nearly fast enough to make sure that every school has those options and every student has those options. There's also some huge equity gaps. So if we look at gender um, and male and female students who took AP computer science, the top bar shows computer science principles, 29% of students were female. For CSA, 22% of students were female. Those numbers have gone up a little bit. The raw numbers are increasing, of course. The percentages have gone up a little bit, but are starting to stagnate a little bit. And so we really need to see what we're doing to encourage more girls to go into computer science when they get to high school. We can also look at race and ethnicity and the students who are taking AP computer science. So the top bar here are the overall student demographics in the state of Ohio. And the bottom bar are the demographics of students who took the AP computer science exam. So you can compare those to see kind of how the race and ethnicity compares to our student population in the state. Um, in particular, the, the blue section on the left, 17% of our Ohio students are black or African-American, but only 7% of the students taking APCS are black or African-American. So we wanna change that, right? Um, we know that the lack of diversity in the software workforce can be traced back. The lack of diversity in university computer science majors, which can be traced back to high school computer science courses. That's why this course data is so important when we are thinking about equity. Uh, so we know that students who take AP computer science in high school are going to be much more likely to major in it when they get to college. They've had that experience. They know what they're getting into when they choose to major in it. And we also know that that can be traced back even further to K through eight. If students have that exposure early on, they're going to know what it is when they get to high school and they're going to opt into it. So code.org, here's our curriculum pathway. Um, like I said, we focus on K through 12. For elementary school, we have computer science fundamentals. For middle school, computer science discoveries. For high school, AP or non-AP computer science principles. And I'm also very excited that coming in 2022, we're going to be launching AP Computer Science A. And I'm particularly excited about the launch of this new curriculum um, because it does have such a, a lack of diversity and we're really focused on building equity into this course. I'm also really excited because we are uh, at code.org partnering with the state of Ohio and uh, Governor DeWine and Lieutenant Governor Hughes said to develop that APCSA course. They've signed on as a state partner, which is incredibly exciting. And they've also said that they guarantee that every Ohio student will have access to computer science courses K through 12. Um, so things are happening in Ohio and we're very excited about that. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Kelly um, to share some more. My name is Kelly Geyer Evans. I'm excited to be joining you all today and, and um, uh, I'm going to expand a little bit on what Katie was just giving an overview of the code.org curriculum. Um, we're going to dive into the middle school and the high school curriculum and the professional learning opportunities which are available this coming school year. Um, uh, if you have questions on the elementary curriculum, I'm happy to answer those, um, but my understanding is the audience is primarily secondary. Um, so as John said, uh, Battelle serves as the code.org regional partner for the state of Ohio. Um, so I get to work closely with Katie and, and others with the national code.org organization. Uh, so starting with the middle school computer science offerings, computer science discoveries is designed particularly for middle school students, um, although it can be implemented in grades nine and 10, especially as schools and districts are thinking about their K-12 student pathway and beginning to um, really uh, think about how they get their students started with computer science if they haven't previously offered computer science. General overview of discoveries, it focuses on personal expression, um, really supports students with making processes explicit. Um, unlike some of the high school uh, courses, not unlike, but it really, really prioritizes making um, or creation over the abstract concepts, which you'll see a little bit more uh, emphasis in the in the high school curriculum. Um, and then throughout the course, students are really engaging in authentic creation. It's designed as a full year course, um, six units spread across, across two semesters. So problem solving and computing, web development, animations and games, the design process, data and society and physical computing. Um, 
However, we know that our middle schools are just as diverse as the middle schoolers within them. Um, and so it's really designed to be flexible, to meet schools um, and their needs based on what they have um, time to get started with. So if you don't have a whole year or a semester, often we see um, schools offer you know, one semester maybe in seventh grade and a second semester in eighth grade, but there are also a lot of additional iterations and our facilitators can work with schools and, and teachers to really um, figure out what makes the most sense based on your school context. Zooming in, I'm going to look at one of the units. This is unit three, interactive animations and games. Um, this is a nine week unit. As you saw on the last slide, each of the units varies in, in length, um, but all of the units are set up with, um, you, you see in the lessons in teal and the lessons in purple here. The teal lessons, students are learning the content, um, discovering how it works, practicing it, uh, and the purple lessons are an opportunity for students to really engage in making, um, as is emphasized in discoveries. So um, there are two week-long projects in this particular unit. The first one, they get to apply their learning in creating an interactive card. So thinking about like a digital birthday card or Christmas card. Um, and the unit, um, the final project is designing a game, which as you can imagine, middle schoolers have a lot of fun with. Um, these are two games that middle school students created um, and, and had to program you know, how do I make the score either go up or down? This um, the one on the bottom has a certain number of lives. So um, they're, they're figuring out how to move those characters, those sprites across the screen. Um, all of those different pieces are, are programmed um, based on what they were learning throughout that unit. The high school computer science course offerings, is, as Katie mentioned, both AP Computer Science principals, and we're super excited to, to bring AP Computer Science A to um, teachers this coming year. Uh, I'm going to zoom into AP Computer Science principles, as that's what's currently available outside of the pilot. Um, the basics, AP Computer Science principles, is, is roughly, you know, see us for non-majors at the, at the college level. Um, because this course was designed to be aligned to the AP college framework, uh, students can earn college credit if, if they take that AP assessment. Um, as Katie mentioned, it can be offered as an AP course or as a non-AP course, um, but we are, code.org's both the professional learning as well as the curriculum is endorsed by the college board. Um, so if you plan to offer it as an AP, there are a lot of resources to get you set up easily um, and to get that approval if you take the professional learning. Uh, an overview of the uh, CS Principles curriculum, there are 10 units. Units 1, 2, and 3, Digital Information, the Internet, and Intro to App Design are covered in the Summer Professional Learning Workshop. Um, and then units 4 through 10, Variables, Conditionals, Functions, List Loops and Traversals, Algorithms, Parameters, Returns, and Libraries, the Create Performance Task, data, cybersecurity, and global impacts are all covered in the four academic year workshops. All of the units are aligned to the College Board and Learning Objectives. Um, and if we zoom in and look at one of these units, just like Discoveries, you'll see it split um, the teal lessons, giving students a chance to explore, really discover what each of these concepts are in practice, and then they get to apply their learning in a project. In this particular project, um, it's a hackathon. I think I set up my share so you guys can see the whole screen. Um, but this, so the student was yep. able to pull a list on Serial, thank you, Katie, um, and uh, program the app so, you know, they can figure out, you know, if someone wanted to identify cereals with the most calories or cereals with the most fat. Um, so they're able to apply that learning from the unit to create that app. Now, as this is preparing students for the performance task on the AP exam. Um, each of those end of unit projects is accompanied with um, an opportunity for students to practice their disciplinary literacy and write about that app that they developed, write about the program um, and, and support it, um, what they made with, with, uh, with the evidence and writing there. So curriculum supports and tools. I'm going to start in this upper left-hand corner with lesson plans. Um, all of the curriculum that Code.org has developed comes with a detailed set of lesson plans. So it has suggested times and lengths for each of the lessons, um, the different resources, so both like slides that you can copy um, and adapt to make your own, the student 
resources and worksheets, links to Code Studio, um, tips from other teachers who have implemented this lesson. Uh, in the middle on the top row here, high quality videos. One of the things I hear from teachers all the time um, is that the videos themselves do a wonderful job of explaining concepts, but also um, the individuals in those videos are just as diverse as the students inside our classroom. So um, as we all know, representation matters and students are able to see themselves in those videos. Um, on the upper right hand corner, the teacher forums here, there's a national forum um, where essentially if you have a question as you're implementing the curriculum, you can post it. Um, Code.org monitors that forum. I have facilitators here in the Ohio, in Ohio who um, are paid to monitor it for certain days of the week. Um, so the response rate is pretty quick, right? If you have a question and, that you've encountered right now inside your classroom and, and you post on that forum, um, you get a prompt response to help support you, in you inside your classroom with your kids. Bottom left-hand corner here, the pack practice performance task, exemplar rubrics. Um, this also applies for discoveries of practice projects, right? Examples of what an exemplar project looks like and rubrics to go along with those as well. Uh, a curriculum guide, which includes the code.org values, the different um, approaches to pedagogy, uh, overview of all the units, all of those pieces are in the, in the uh, curriculum guide overview. And then finally, in the lower right hand side, the teacher dashboard. So students are um, inside Code Studio often doing some of their lessons. And so as a teacher, you can figure out, you know, how are they progressing on that lesson? And when there's a specific like, check for understanding, you can go in and give them feedback on their responses there. Um, there are a number of tools and widgets which have been developed to support students in learning the concepts. Um, so here is one of the versions of the Internet Simulator um, where students are able to, to figure out, you know, how do routers work and how do we deliver packages and, and things like that. Uh, the professional learning cohort for grades 6 through 12 um, is starts with a five day summer workshop. Um, so this year it will take place July 12th through the 16th. We are going to be virtual again this summer. We hope to have everybody back in a face-to-face -face environment for the academic, uh, the academic year workshops, which take place on Saturdays throughout the school year. Um, we will be offering that virtually as well, even if we go back face-to-face -face this year. Um, in addition to the national forum, um, to really emphasize and build community here in the state of Ohio, we also have a cohort Slack channel um, where cohort members are able to connect to one another outside of those official professional learning days. So if they have questions or want to share resources, you know, as we have policy updates, we were able to um, connect with one another in that Slack channel, um, both while they're in the cohort and um, when they graduate to become alumni. The professional learning is designed for those who are planning to teach computer science discoveries or computer science principles during the school year that they're taking that professional learning. Um, so you do not have to have background or experience in computer science to get started. Uh, I do put an asterisk there because I, it's really important that we are aware of the state licensure requirements. Um, currently, there is a waiver in place saying that if a teacher um, takes a professional learning course to support them in teaching a specific computer science course, they can teach that course. Um, they can teach that course, which they've had that learning for. Uh, we are excited that we anticipate this will be extended for the next two school years. Um, it's currently in the budget that was proposed by the governors and is currently moving through the legislature. Um, there are also the traditional licensure routes to computer science um, and the endorsement and supplemental license. Um, we're joined here with John Wiseman, so if you have specific questions, he is the expert there, although I am happy to help you navigate those as well. Uh, we have scholarships available. Our priorities are schools. Um, that have a free and reduced lunch population of 50% or higher, or if you're a rural region, 40% or higher. Uh, and then a, uh, if you have students um, with a rate of, from marginalized racial and ethnic groups that are traditionally underrepresented in computer science of greater than 50%. Uh, or 50 percent or higher rather um, and if, if you do not meet those uh, priorities the cost is 1300 um, although we do we do make exceptions once the priority application has passed um, if we have additional scholarships available so applications are now open the link is here I'll leave it in the notes for everybody um, after I 
finish presenting here and I turn it over to Girls Who Code, I do want to leave you with one quote from a teacher um, who has been a part of now both the Discoveries and the Principals cohort. So happy to answer any questions that you may have either here or I'll leave my contact information with you as well. Thank you. All right, Katie and Kelly, thank you very much. Uh, looking so forward to working with you to expand computer science. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a fantastic year, uh, the next 12 to 24 months. So really, really look forward to that. Okay, so now we're going to um, turn it over to Cabret Yabedi, who is joining us from Girls Who Code. And recently, the Department of Education in Ohio has agreed to work in partnership with Girls Who Code. And we look forward to getting more involved this year. Last year was, was tough for everybody, but this year we're really hoping to get much more involved with them. And Girls Who Code offers the resources schools need to start a club today. And we'll be offering their summer immersion program. And they just are doing just amazing things um, out there. So I will go ahead and turn it over. Thanks so much, John. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, and I also am so appreciative of everyone else who presented ahead of me. I think a lot of what I'm going to say is definitely in line with all of the values that everyone presenting today um, demonstrated. I want to talk briefly, and I apologize, I know that these are all condensed, but I wanted to briefly start with a little context behind the mission behind Girls Who Code and why we do this work. And that can't be done without talking about the importance of gender equity in STEM. And again, I know we heard this in the code.org presentation. I wanted to highlight some specific statistics around girls and girls' participation just to help set the context for why we have a clubs program and how we try to reach girls at a very young age. Uh, so the challenge as we see it is to uh, close the gender gap in tech. As you can see here, we did some research with an outside uh, consulting firm called Accenture to come up with these numbers. And it is pretty uh, staggering to see the decline in female representation in tech, particularly those two notes at the bottom for only 19% of students who receive a degree in computing are women and only 2% are women of color. Of course, um, equity and diversity is a huge part of the problem with the gender gap. And so at Girls who code, we really try to make our mission uh, to help young girls get the exposure and the tools and the training that they need to really thrive in this industry. Very quickly here, I wanted to give you an overview of some of our direct service programs. Today, I'll be diving in deeply into clubs program just because I think that's most useful for this group. But if you have any questions about the other programs that I discuss, I'm more than happy to talk to you one on one about those. Um, so clubs, I won't dive into now as I'll do the presentation on that. But I wanted to talk about our Code at Home series, which we developed last year in response to the pandemic. Um, it's a free series of coding activities that are available on our website for download. You don't even need to start a Girls Who Code club to um, use or share those activities. It really, like I said, was designed to help girls who are at home and whose clubs that they were a part of last year, you know, were suspended due to virtual learning. Um, and in that period where everyone was getting acclimated, we wanted to offer free resource. So that's something I encourage everyone to look at um, just to share with even students or young folks in your lives. The summer immersion program, um, we've just wrapped up our recruitment season, so technically applications are closed, but I am more than happy to talk to folks who um, are very interested in that program. It's a kind of condensed version of our larger clubs academic year program. It's a two week now, of course, virtual program for girls and students who identify as non-binary. The distinction there is that the summer program really is for girls and, as I said, students who identify as non-binary, while our clubs program is actually inclusive to young boys who want to join as well. And then finally, our alumni program is not really a formal program, but it's a catch all for where all of our students who participate in any of those programs kind of fall into. We really try to maintain a connection with all of our Girls Who Code alumni, regardless of the program that they participated in. Um, I know it was brought up in the code.org presentation and I can't reiterate it enough. Um, it's really important to help nurture that interest that girls uh, present in STEM at a very young age to make sure that it's not lost to a lot of the socialization that young girls receive that kind of discourages pursuing it. And then very briefly here, I just wanted to show our impact. Uh, we're definitely very concerned with making sure that our programs are equitable and are reaching the students who need it most. So we're really excited to say that 50% of the students who participated in any of those programs came from historically underrepresented groups. 
And then in terms of the network that we've cultivated and the way that we stay in touch with students, at the alumni level, we've seen that our college age students who either did the SIP program or the clubs program are majoring in CS fields at 15 times the national average. So we're really excited to see and um, continue to nurture their interests all through college and even into their career. Our educational philosophy at Girls Who Code, as you can imagine, is as focused on the other skill sets that help young girls and young women thrive in this industry, even apart from coding. So, of course, the first uh, kind of pillar of this educational philosophy is more than code, which is to say that, of course, the curriculum that we provide offers coding tutorials, but we do offer a lot of other activities and uh, kind of esteem building exercise that help young girls really feel comfortable in this space, not just learning the technical skills they need, but learning the confidence skills they need to kind of make sure that they can um, not just thrive, but be leaders. And then finally, the third pillar is real world relevance and impact. The entire curriculum really culminates and directs students to build an impact project based on the skills they learned. So if they're in weekly sessions, Girls Who Code Clubs and doing the coding tutorials, a portion of that session each week will actually be dedicated to talking about this overarching project that they're working on. Um, I encourage you to go to our girlswhocode.com website. I think it's just slash project gallery to see some of the past projects from students. They're really inspiring. Some of them are apps. Some of students develop websites. Uh, and it's nice to see uh, the different ways that students kind of take in the same curriculum, but put together or create these very different products. So this slide is probably the most important in, in terms of helping you understand the difference between the, the two curricula we offer. So there's a sixth through 12th grade curriculum and a third through fifth grade clubs curriculum. Uh, there's no like prerequisite if you have students who, uh, if you want to, you know, work with students who are at the sixth to 12th grade level, there's no need for them to have gone through the third through fifth grade club experience, but of course it doesn't hurt. Um, and we like to see that, you know, with students who are younger and in that third through fifth grade club uh, level, we find that they're very eager to just go directly into that sixth through 12th grade kind of pipeline, which is exciting to see. Uh, the sixth through 12th grade curriculum is far more robust. It has about 120 hours of content. So that includes those coding tutorials, as well as some of those additional activities that I mentioned. And um, the third through fifth grade club curriculum can definitely be seen as a primer or an introduction to overall computational thinking and creative problem solving. And so not to say that, again, like you need to pair them, but if they are paired, it's a very nice transition from some of the basics into some of the more specific um, activities and coding languages that are at the sixth through 12th grade level. And I should note there that we don't have any recommendations in terms of delineating the club experience. There's not a curriculum for sixth, then seventh, then eighth, then ninth. It's just an all encompassing. So you can decide if you know you feel it's appropriate to have 12th graders in your club with sixth graders, or if you wanna instead have two clubs at your school or in your district um, and have a sixth grade club for like middle school students and then have one that's a little bit more for the older students. It's completely flexible and based on what you think would work best. And so finally here, I see the time, so I'll make sure to run through this a little quickly. This is just a sample session of what an hour meeting of a Girls Who Code 6th through 12th grade club session looks like. Again, these are all materials that we provide. The resources are completely free. You don't have to have CS experience uh, to start or launch a club. We really set up the lesson plan so that someone who's never done this before can guide their students through it. Um, and like I said, there are activities there that are nice icebreakers and resources like things like um, a women in tech spotlight series where we offer spotlights and highlighting different women across the, the various tech fields, again, to kind of offer that representation and help girls feel at the start of the session that, you know, there's someone to look up to and they can kind of see real world accomplishments that helps connect to the skills that they're learning in the session. And then very quickly here, just a third through fifth grade club sample session. It's very similar. Some of the naming conventions for the activities are a bit different. And for the third through fifth grade club session, um, you'll see in the resources that I provide that there's different, uh, you know, styles in terms of your student's attention span and ability to kind of commit to maybe an hour session. It's, you know, more than fine to limit these to 30 minutes if you find that that's more manageable, especially now with everything able to go virtually. But of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, we want students on Zoom for an hour and a half club meeting. So there's a lot of flexibility in our program. So lastly, what you need to get started is just an in-person or a virtual space. 
technology and internet, your students need that as well. And then finally, a facilitator or a decision maker. Facilitator is the, the name of the person who's running the club. So that's typically a teacher at a school who's volunteering to either do this after school or kind of embed it into the regular day instruction. And so that person's the facilitator. The decision maker is often someone at the admin level, like John, who's our community partner representative um, as a part of our partnership with Ohio Department of Education. And that person may not necessarily be involved in each club session, but does have oversight over the whole program and has some insight into how many clubs have been started across, let's say, the Ohio, you know, uh, Ohio schools network. And then lastly, this is everything that we provide if you have those, you know, initial first three things, customizable lesson plans, like I said, all pre prepared as well as logistical support. So I am a community partner manager at Girls Who Code for the state of Ohio. So I work with all of our partners across the state. And that also means that I work with our individual clubs across the state. So if you needed some extra support, or we're looking for a way to help recruit facilitators at your school and kind of offer this information to them and you know inspire them to start a club, I'm more than happy to support in that way. So lastly, what's next? I just wanna leave you with this slide so you can maybe take down those notes in the website. All you have to do to get a preview of this curriculum, if you're interested in seeing more, is create a free account at hq.girlswhocode.com. HQ is our portal where all students and facilitators would sign up to create an account and access the curriculum. The good thing is if your students sign up and you sign up, then the students have access to the curriculum even outside the club session. So they really could keep going and, and look at the material and get ahead if they were so inspired, but they also just have regular access during the, the normal club instruction time that you set. Um, so in terms of the pathway here, just to create an account gives you a free curriculum preview. So it's just a few of the resources we offer. But then to actually see the entire curriculum, you would need to complete a club's application. A club's application does not necessarily mean that you intend to start a club tomorrow. We just ask that you complete it to set the intention. It's more than fine to complete the application today, knowing that you plan to start a club in the next academic year. You can note that on the application. So we'll reach out later on with more support, but I encourage you to do so if you know this is something that you wanna share the resources because Opening a club's application, again, there's no requirement that you necessarily lead individual club sessions on a weekly basis, even if you want to begin by just offering these resources in tandem with other CS programming, for instance, our Women in Tech Spotlights, which you know doesn't often appear in regular CS instruction, that's more than fine to do. If you are really interested, however, in starting multiple clubs and want a little guidance and how to coordinate all that, definitely feel free to complete the club's application now and connect with me and I can help lead and support with some of the, the um, growing interest that you might have or kind of figuring out the configuration between some of the curricula we offer. Uh, but with that, once you complete an application, you'll get an approval email fairly quickly and then you can launch your club anytime. And finally, I'm just going to leave that bit.ly link up if you'd like. Um, of course, we'll share a copy of this presentation with John, but if you'd like some specific resources around clubs or want to just connect with me directly and receive an email from me, feel free to sign up there and I'll send you a follow up note. Oh, great. With that, with one minute left, I'll, I'll stop sharing and uh, let John close us out. Wow, how much amazing information did we just pack into the last hour? Um, I do encourage you to take a little bit of time and I'll stay a little bit later. Uh, any of the links, we have posted links for all of these great resources over in the chat. So we'll stay here. Feel free to um, go ahead and find those links. We will add um, the presentations to our, uh, once we create the video of this. However, it does take us a little bit of time to get this through our process of editing and, and through communication and those kind of things. Um, I do want to thank the, the the three groups today. These are all groups that, that I have just utmost respect for and have worked with and, and really, you know, just uh, it's amazing how much availability of resources and support and all those different things.